Hello, everybody. Um, uh, as, as Mark said, uh, I'm Pete Thomas. Um, I lead uh, on data innovation for the PRA. Um, for those of you that don't know much about financial services, we are part of the Bank of England. Um, so we're part of the central bank and we focus on the prudential regulations. So we focus on keeping banks uh, and financial systems safe and sound. Um, we have a partner regulator, the conduct regulator called the FCA. Um, and they look predominantly at how we treat, uh, how financial services treats customers um, and sort of looks after conduct issues like money laundering, uh, day protection, all that sort of stuff as well. So, so we're the kind of bit that does stuff in the background, the stuff that hopefully you uh, you never hear about. Um, uh, very occasionally, unfortunately, you do. Uh, obviously, um, we were all over the front page 2008, 2010, and we're working very hard to make sure we don't end up there again uh, with COVID. Um, in terms of what I'm going to talk to you uh, today about, I'm going to give you a very quick run through. First of all, um, what is tech doing in this sort of space, in the what we call fintech, regtech, subtech, if in doubt, put tech after it. So I'll go through those um, th those acronyms for you. Uh, a bit about what we're doing, uh, particularly on with regulatory data and how we're trying to use technology to uh, help us uh, regulate the banks uh, in, in a more effective way and regulate insurers as well. Uh, then I'm going to take you through uh, a bit of a story of um, of of, uh, of of my team and how we how we how we kind of look to lead innovation within the Bank of England, which is a fairly old-fashioned institution. And then finally, I'm going to go on to examples of our work um, at the end. So, sort of four sections. I'm hopefully going to be able to keep to about 10 minutes per section, um, and uh, we'll leave some time for questions at the end. Okay, so starting just with uh, what is fintech. So, thank you very much, Mark. You've uh, already jumped the slide there. It's brilliant. Uh, so when we say fintech, we literally mean any tech that helps financial services. Um, it tends to be, um, if you like, sort of seen it or, or thought about in kind of three onions um, or three, th th three bits of the skin of an onion. Uh, so the first bit is operations infrastructure stuff, the stuff that probably everyone on this call knows very well, um, which is about how, for, uh, how, how, how banks and the banking system runs its own internal uh, mechanisms. And there's a lot of leg legacy infrastructure kind of built into that uh, and a huge amount of, of spend just on maintaining that, that legacy infrastructure. Um, that is the kind of core of our existing banking system. What we're currently seeing now um, is uh, a large number of bolt-ons um, to that core infrastructure trying to do different things. So I'm not, I'm not going to go around this whole slide, uh, but you've got everything from work in the wealth management um, um, area where you're looking at robo advisory, you're looking at social investing, you're looking at firms like Nutmeg are very active in this space. Uh, you may have seen have, are, are able to derive quite a lot of value out of providing better customer services uh, and better access to that central systems core. Um, at the other, at the complete other end, um, in the kind of um, in the re in the retail uh, and commercial space, um, you've got. Um, a big, 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 big changes coming in in how uh, people deliver money to uh, to borrowers um, and trying to make that um, more streamlined. Um, the obvious example of that is in is, uh, is things like the money and price comparison sites for both uh, corporate and uh, retail loans. Um, but you're also uh, looking more and more now at various forms of digital cash management, uh, both for um, both for uh, retail consumers uh, and also for businesses. Uh, and then frankly, everything in between. Um, the, only, the final one I'm gonna mention is the insurance sector. Um, probably some of the most advanced and most interesting from a sort of, if you're a, if you're a real techie, um, uh, work uh, um, in, in financial services is happening in the insurance space, uh, predominantly based on predict predictive analytics, makes sense. Um, they've been doing a huge amount for example, around COVID, around areas of the, of, of the economy that will open up or not open up uh, and what that will mean for their various risk, risk profiles. There's quite interesting stuff there as well. So that's fintech generally. If we move on to the next slide, what you've got is regtech. So within, within that broad envelope, um, you've then got m large um, application of tech to various regulatory tasks. A lot of that stemming since 2010, um, the uh, financial crisis, resulting in a huge amount of um, legislation uh, and uh, work for the financial services sector uh, to try and uh, provide a more effective way of complying with, re with regulation and also a more efficient way of giving both um, shareholders and customers insights into the actions of regulatory firms. So far, what we've seen uh, in RegTech is a focus on conduct. So we've seen, if you've probably, if you've 
added it up, you're probably looking at about 80% plus of, fit of, uh, of reg tech. It's in the conduct space. Uh, it's looking at things uh, like uh, KYC, which is know your customer. Um, it's looking at things like digital identities um, and fraud monitoring and control and moving more and more now into the into the risk, man, uh, risk management and sort of risk aggregation space as well um, and how and how you can basically streamline those customer journeys uh, at, at the same time as tying them into um, real-time MI um, within the bank. Uh, the area that I work in is the area that I think probably has had least development in RegTech uh, which is in the financial space and that's because financial policy uh, by its very nature tends to be highly aggregated um, and so one of the areas that I'll come on to a bit later is in regulatory reporting, where we're doing a lot of work to say, can we use technology to enable us to get faster insights at the aggregate level rather than at the, uh, at the, uh, at the detailed level? Um, similarly, in terms of data management, I think regulators are probably um, slightly behind the curve across not just actual financial services, but I talked to a lot of other, other regulators as well. Um, at doing really effective and efficient data management. Again, that's another area uh, that we're doing uh, more and more work on. And then the third area uh, we're working on uh, um, is, is, is in the governance space. So things like we have a senior managers regime where we effectively interview senior managers of financial institutions before they can take on their post, they must be signed off by us. Um, at the moment, we do a very, very small number of senior managers at the very, very top of the organization. We are looking at how we can expand that regime and, and, and sort of make that regime work more efficiently and more effectively uh, across a, a wider portfolio of responsibilities without providing huge, you know, far greater onerous uh, kind of work, both for ourselves who are resource constrained and firms who are similarly not massively keen on doing endless interviews um, um, for, uh, for compliance purposes. So that's RegTech. And then the, um, the third bit, sort of the third layer down, is subtech. This is basically what I spend my time uh, working on um, day to day. Um, and we split it broadly into two, two fields. We talk about data collection and data analytics. Um, so within the collection space, we look at how can we gather information more, more quickly. Um, that is both about how we can collect information faster, but also about how we can help firms and consumers understand that information. And then thirdly, how we can manage it uh, within um, our own organizations as well. In the analytics space, um, we're doing a lot uh, across a whole variety of fields. Um, misconduct analysis is probably predominantly within the FCA. The other three are very much uh, at the Bank of England. We're doing more and more market surveillance. Uh, we're beginning now to use um, uh, uh, various forms of data management to uh, improve our credit risk and liquidity risk management. Um, and we're starting, and I would stress starting, to get into the kind of forecasting, emerging risk signaling uh, kind of uh, space as well. So that's your three, that's your three acronyms. Um, I'm going to move on now and talk a little bit more about uh, our own work in this space and how we see it fitting in. Thanks, Mark. Um, so basically, last year, um, our former governor now, uh, Mark Carney, uh, commissioned uh, what's called a future of finance report, which, which had a fairly simple aim, uh, basically, um, it was to assess what will finance look like in 2030 uh, and what will the Bank of England need to do uh, to work on that. And it came up with um, basically a couple of, uh, of, of uh, kind of key uh, recommendations. The first was to recognise the new economy, uh, which sounds simple, but in practice is actually um, quite difficult because it's moving quite fast. Um, and the fact that, you know, as we have a, a, a more um, a more digital economy, we are dramatically increasing the volume of data that we are producing. And at the same time, we're also being asked for far, far more um, detailed metrics and a far greater variety of metrics that flex far quicker. Uh, a really good example of this uh, is in the climate change space, uh, where you've seen an explosion in what are called environmental, social and governance or ESG um, reporting. Uh, from a variety of financial firms. Um, we've pushed that quite hard. We think reporting is a key plank, one plank uh, of, uh, of our approach uh, to climate change more generally. And we think the technology more broadly uh, can be a key part of the solution to driving a more efficient economy and therefore more energy efficient economy and therefore better use of resources, et cetera, et cetera. So we kind of try to blend those together in our view of, of, of what the new economy looks like. The next slide, um, should then flag sort of what does that mean for finance? So what does that mean for us? So the most obvious thing it means very, very simply and everybody on this call has probably noticed is we have less cash in our pockets than we used to. That doesn't mean we have less cash 
in general means we have less physical money. Um, and instead, um, we bank far more online. Um, we see payments being digitized dramatically. And as a central bank, that's actually quite a big deal because we we print banknotes. We are, you know, that's one of our products. Um, however, we're not seeing um, cash disappear. Um, we're seeing its use become uh, more concentrated in certain parts of society uh, and also more concentrated in certain sectors. And that means we have to think quite carefully about how we deliver cash to those uh, people and those sectors uh, to ensure that they can still uh, participate fully in the financial system. Um, there's a large number of people who remain unbanked in completely within, within the UK. Uh, and we, we, do a, we do a lot of work to think about how we can include them in an economy which is becoming increasingly digitalized. Um, second thing uh, we're, we're looking at is around um, how things like artificial intelligence, machine learning um, can change uh, and boost uh, productivity um, and in th uh, sort of hopefully uh, start to solve what we've seen for the last 20 years, which is a sort of flattening of the, of, of, of the productivity curve um, and um, the UK particularly actually struggling to maintain pace with its international peers on productivity. Um, and we're looking at how that can, can be kind of uh, worked. And some of the work I'll come on to later will touch in this space. And then thirdly, I mentioned um, ESG earlier. Um, we're conscious that there is a huge shift in resource allocation currently taking place uh, within the financial sector. Um, some, of that, some of that has actually been accelerated uh, during COVID. Um, a lot of that um, has been in the works for a long time, um, but is coming to fruition now. And we're seeing the fairly large rebalancing of portfolios um, across the piece. Um, what does that mean for us um, as a central bank? It means, first of all, that our payment systems are having to process higher volumes than ever before um, of, 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 of money moving around, which puts, puts, puts strain on that original core infrastructure I spoke about earlier. Um, it also means, again, that we're having to uh, get our, our heads and, and, our, and uh, our hands on uh, completely new metrics that we that really economists haven't thought about uh, before. Uh, things around the globalization of finance, the movement uh, of capital and the movement of knowledge um, and, and the value of that. Um, all of that is really, you know, not in central bankers sort of normal wheelhouse um, and, uh, and there's a lot of work going on there. So we go to the, the, the next slide, um, which talks about FinTech at the BOE. So this is effectively our 2019 uh, FinTech priorities. These are unsurprisingly because of COVID still going. <laughs> um, we haven't refreshed these yet. Um, I think they will be refreshed. Um, I don't think there'll be a huge amount of change. Um, what I'm sort of going to talk to you more about, which is the work that my team does, is around deepening our red tech and sub tech strategy. Um, but I just want, you know, it's very important to sort of flag that we're also looking at things like financial stability implications, about risks outside, what we call outside the perimeter. So basically, what firms do we need to bring in to our regulation perimeter to ensure the stability of the system? Um, we are increasingly conscious that we've had QE um, and uh, extremely low interest rates now for a decade. Uh, and that has led to um, some quite significant moves of capital around the financial system. We need to work and make sure that we're, that we're comfortable with that. Um, we also um, are having to make sure that we uh, uh, look at how we can integrate financial services into other areas. So we're looking at expanding the, the use of best in class messaging standards. So people on this call will be probably uh, fairly aware of things like uh, LEIs, ISOs, UPIs. There's a, there is even more acronyms that I could keep reeling off in, in, in that space. But that really, to me, is all about how do we central bank link into not just the financial system, but actually the, the economic system as it digitizes uh, over time. And then what I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, for the rest of this uh, is now about where we can apply our fintech capabilities uh, within the central bank um, ourselves. Um, so we do have three three areas. We look at how fintech can fintech uh, can um, either undermine or enhance financial stability. We look at how it can affect the individual firms that we regulate um, in, uh, in in fairly great degree, and where they're being com where they may or may not be out competed by new entrants uh, and new players. And then uh, my own team focuses on how can we apply this technology internally to improve our insights. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, now. So we're going to move on uh, to the next slide. So effectively, this is a story that I imagine um, anybody who's been involved in public sector IT over the last 10 years will have come uh, come across similar stories. Um, 
it's a story of a, an organization that is getting to grips with um, the new data landscape and trying to work out how you do innovation in a uh, institution that by its very design is risk averse um, and by its very design is quite bureaucratic um, because it takes fairly big decisions and normally takes the big decisions fairly slowly. So if you think about um, when the PRA joined the Bank of England in 2013, it joined an institution that worked on normally quarterly cycles up to quarterly meetings or uh, six weekly or occasionally monthly cycles and it was fairly embedded in that process and that's the cycle around setting interest rates, the cycle around um, uh, moving around macroprudential tools, the cycles around um, resolving um, firms, the cycles around market um, uh, kind of changes and it looks at an economy which changes over let's say the financial cycle is around eight to ten years. So that's how it operates generally. And when we set uh, the PRA up, uh, we spent the first two, three years actually just trying to make sure that we had the supply side right. So we had at least got the information to allow us to do what is a much more um, higher cadence, um, but also quite a lot more administrative uh, set of work to actually regulate firms on a day-to-day -day basis, um, which involved the collection of large amounts of information uh, both from the financial sector, but also from uh, fellow regulators, uh, from counterparts across Europe, uh, and sharing data um, with uh, third parties and publishing data as well uh, in quite large volumes. Um, in 2016, um, we um, set up a, a review to basically say, okay, we think we've, we've done not too badly on the supply side. Um, how, um, how can we shift towards the, the demand side? And as all good consultancies do, they tell you what, what you already know, but they put it, but they put it in a nice package and they uh, present it to you very clearly and they suggest uh, to you some ways uh, of moving forward. And effectively, they asked, they challenged us really to look at how, okay, if you're, if you're looking towards um, sort of your know, analytics, how are you going to furnish your demand uh, and to engage with uh, our kind of customers, as it were, which are 1,400 regulators, uh, and how their business is going to change, uh, having collected all this data. Uh, and so we started off by setting up in uh, 2017 the, uh, what was called the data management function. Uh, it's a very small team, so I started off with there was four FTE, um, and we were literally uh, trying to encourage um, end users to actually try and make better use of the data they had. And by, by better use, I do simply mean moving beyond Excel. Uh, in, 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 in many, many instances. Um, we also started to get our hands around data governance uh, and try to encourage uh, regulators to think not just about decision governance, but actually also data governance as well, uh, which was not a completely new concept, but newer than uh, I would like to, to be at the time. Um, and then we also looked at um, how can we explore uh, using new technologies, um, which is the red tech stuff that I spoke about before. And by 2018, we built a fairly uh, strong, uh, fairly uh, good track record of having those conversations and, get, and, 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 and getting that going. Um, and that allowed us to then begin to tackle uh, some much bigger PRA-wide challenges, uh, which I'm now going to come on to talk to you about. Uh, and, we, and in that, at the same time, we transitioned from a data management function to a data innovation function quite deliberately. So we were very, very conscious that we didn't want to be um, a team that sucked in um, data uh, and, da and data delivery uh, from outside, like, like you may imagine some traditional IT departments do. Uh, we wanted to push it out uh, and, and switching from being a data management manager to a data innovation manager was quite an important part of that. Uh, it also allowed us to change the profile of the team and we've now expanded to around, we're going to be close to 20 FTE, made up predominantly of data scientists, um, data, go uh, data government specialists and privacy specialists who can provide a service to the business as they do this work themselves. So that's effectively where we came from. If we go to the next slide. Um, we basically then split our work into two areas. So we talk about optimizing and transforming um, how we use data. Um, and that's everything from data discovery and actually knowing what we have, which is uh, often, often, often the most interesting work that we do actually, flagging to senior people information they didn't, they didn't even know we had access to. Um, find, fixing and exploring, I'll come on to a little bit later. We do a lot of work on talent and skills. Um, which is basically around how can we hire uh, new people, but also how can we upskill and train our own people? 
um, and we have put together a, a fairly comprehensive red tech strategy which actually sets out how we do this at an organization level. Um, and on the next slide, we do what is sometimes seen as the more boring uh, sort of back office function. Um, it actually, it's the area that I personally come from. It's the area that, you, you know, I often say you don't get the shiny stuff uh, without the hard stuff. This is the hard stuff uh, around privacy and information management, uh, a cultural data ownership, which I think we are still in the foothills of. I don't, I don't think we've got a cultural data ownership yet in the PRA. Um, I think we, we're still very much regulators like to, like to see themselves as users of data, not owners of data. I think we're moving that dial. Um, and also um, a large chunk of governance, as, as, as every good public service bureaucracy will know. Um, if, there's a, if you're not sure what it is, govern it. And you're still not sure what it is, have another committee uh, as well. Um, so we do try and work on that. The primary objective of my team is actually to shut down um, governance committees and get those that exist to take more uh, responsibility, which is quite a challenging task. Uh, but we have found that if you get rid of four and force one to think about everything, uh, they can come up with some quite interesting answers quite often. Um, that's governance. And then we move on to the next slide. So then we talk about, OK, so what does this actually mean? In fact, what does it mean that we actually do? How do we get um, our colleagues to change the way uh, that they're working? Uh, and the simplest way to do this is what we call find and fix. Um, and find and fix um, at its most simple level is to take the process on the top half of that slide, which is a process that involves a lot of information coming in, often via email. An awful lot of people then doing things with it before it even gets saved or stored anywhere. Normally, by this point, it's saved or stored at least 10 times in different formats. Then the same people uh, will then transfer, will, will then play around with it in Excel. Again, at least 10, we're now talking about probably 20 or 30 versions now exist. Um, and then finally, uh, a number of different versions would appear um, in, in Tableau or some sort of similar front end uh, system if you're lucky. And if, and if you're really lucky, one of those will be uh, comprehensive and clean enough to actually make sense uh, to a senior policymaker. Um, that is a hugely resource intensive way of operating. It's the way that most finance regulation has been done for the last 10, 15 years. Um, we, working with those people in the top left hand corner, uh, have tried to streamline those processes. Um, and so we have tried to uh, remove as much, if not all, uh, interaction with the, with the information before it is stored. Uh, so it is stored in one place and, 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 and stored uh, kind of, you know, by one set of, with one set of conventions that, e that everybody can find. And then we have tried to uh, reduce significantly um, the, um, the kind of Excel layer, uh, what, what, what we sometimes refer to as the Wild West um, kind of uh, approach to uh, data delivery and instead have straight through processing into tools like Tableau, Shiny, that sort of thing. Uh, that can that can produce results. Um, we're not completely there, but I think this is probably the bit that gets the biggest bang for our buck when we go and work with frontline staff, uh, because they can see very tangibly two of those stages effectively disappear uh, and their life becomes easier. Um, on the next slide, having done that, um, we then start to experiment with how can we use um, slightly more advanced, I would stress the word slightly more advanced uh, technologies uh, to begin to use that data uh, in different ways. Um, so as well as giving it to people to do fast analytics and make quick decisions on, how can we also mine that information more effectively uh, and how can we derive uh, more insight uh, and uh, benefits relation from it. Uh, and so we do a variety of proof of concept. Uh, this is just one of them. We did one proof of concept looking at um, how we can exploit um, machine learning uh, to provide us a, uh, with greater insight into what we call firm MI. Firm MI is effectively unstructured data that comes from um, the firms that we regulate. Um, and at the moment, the classic way of dealing with that is that you throw people at it and they read it. Um, and often they, uh, if you go back, if you think, think about the previous slide, um, they, they read it and then they file it uh, in a variety of places. And then they come back to it and read it again. And then they'll produce an Excel spreadsheet off the back of it. Uh, and then somebody else do the same thing and then it will get combined and you can see how it, you can see where this ends. Um, what we try to do is to look at how can machine learning help us to both improve the efficiency of finding that data. So can we get machine learning to actually file it for us? Can we then get it to uh, start to uh, do uh, to build peers, uh, sorry, to build trends uh, across peers uh, and to share that information? Um, and then 
uh, as a result of that, can we then start to plug in some of the key questions that we ask about their data all the time and actually get answers to those things? Um, and so far, we're pretty confident on the first two. We're pretty confident we can, we can improve the efficiency of finding it, and we're pretty confident we, we, we can improve the efficiency of uh, sharing, sharing trends um, and, 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 uh, and peer groups. We're still experimenting on the, on, on the can we actually ask the questions directly uh, and, and get more answers. Um, so that's the sort of next level up. And then if you keep going uh, to the next slide, um, you then get into, OK, so that's how we deal with information from firms. But then can we also uh, make our own rule book um, machine readable? Um, so can we actually turn the information that we produce uh, for firms and make that more accessible uh, by their own systems? Um, and so we're doing a lot of work at the moment. This diagram is a very, very, very simplified version uh, of uh, trying to meet uh, Mark Carney's aim, which is to, within three to five years, make the PRA's rule book machine readable. That does not mean that we will have the entire PRA rule book in code form, uh, and all you will have to do to be regulated is comply with code. That's not what it means. Uh, what it does mean is we will have a way, is we will give you a way of ingesting that, uh, which is understandable and intelligible to a machine, uh, and, with, uh, and, and, and which a machine can use to process the instructions and start to tell you more quickly what you need to do um, as a bank, financial institution, insurer, whatever. Um, the challenge of this, uh, each of those black dots uh, on that picture, that's not um, a, a um, rule. It's not even a set of rules. It's a, it's a set of legislation. So those black dots can run to thousands of pages on their own. Um, and they are all interconnected. Uh, worryingly, um, some are more interconnected than others, and the interconnections don't always make a huge amount of sense because they are, part, they, they are the, the, the result of negotiations between lawyers over a very, very, very long, long period of time. So the first challenge is to unpick that web and work out um, how we can actually instruct a machine to follow its way through uh, from the top to the bottom uh, and understand uh, what they need to do at each level. So top level is regulation, then technical standards, then rule book, and then the bottom is supervisory statements, which is sort of the stuff that we give to firms directly um, and, and, and that we publish. Um, so there's sort of increasing levels of detail um, and often increasing complexity at both the rule book and the regulation level where a lot of the legal jargon is used uh, and, and, and confused quite a lot. And then finally, uh, this, is, this, is, this is me sort of finishing up, um, the most kind of moonshot or kind of longer, longer term piece of work that we're doing is to say, OK, if we can get to the point that the, the rule book is machine readable, can we then digitise regulatory reporting completely? Um, and this is a joint project that, that we've been doing with the uh, FCA, the Conduct Authority, um, and we're effectively saying, can we take our conduct and prudential rule books, which when printed off and stacked up, um, depends on who you ask, but they are either, you know, sort of 10 feet plus, or some people even claim they're sort of 10 meters plus, uh, depends if you if you put all the ancillary legislation or not, but basically they are a huge amount of information. And a large chunk of that um, is instructions uh, to say, right, you must report against the rest. So if you think about um, a, a rule book, about 10% of it probably, a very, this is a very much a guesstimate level, um, is going to say, OK, you now must report against the other 90%. And what we're trying to do is to see whether you can turn that 10% into not just machine readable, but actually machine executable um, code. So this is the 10% that actually potentially you could um, send uh, to a firm and they could then basically process it with no human in intervention at all and send you information back. Uh, and so effectively you remove the human interpretation implementation on the top slide uh, and you end up with a fully automated interpretation and implementation uh, into systems and reports back to us. Why is this important? Because this means that we supervise 1,500 firms, the FCA supervise 55,000 roughly, they, that number goes up all the time, firms. They have 55,000 interpretations of their rules. We have 1,500. Uh, we would like to get to, you know, at least a central consensus on how these are done uh, without, ha without firms having to use huge numbers of consultants uh, and ourselves having to squash together and mash together huge amounts of data. That really is, however, a long term objective. That is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and, and we'll see uh, what, what, whether we can get there um, over, the, uh, over the coming years. 
and that um for me is everything so i'm going to stop there i have just about hit time um and uh, if people have questions they want to ask please do uh, please do fire in okay thank you very much peter um i noticed we have got some questions um if i can just put some of them to you yeah um, go for it okay so the first one here is um from uh, john beard what are your experiences for us from trying to achieve data interoperability across the various autonomous organizations in the fintech world including ontology taxonomy formats etc yeah uh, okay um so we've tried this in a number of different ways um i'll talk about three different groups of approaches that, that we've seen so we've worked we've we, we have looked at a number of consultants who claim they can do this and can produce it um and we think that for certain pieces of legislation um in the regulatory sphere that is doable um however it tends to be whether whether leg legislation is very well defined and ideally defined um within uh one legal jurisdiction uh so we've seen examples have most they have a most benefit at doing this uh with, with uk law um or with european law um or with an, 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 another jurisdiction and there are some examples of where that has worked quite well uh, and there are tools out there that you can buy that effectively start to meld and pull together these information uh, that information where we tend to work um is uh in a much messier uh sort of s s set of environments and therefore uh we have um worked with fintechs to do uh to do some work and we've also done some work our, uh, internally ourselves with fintechs we've seen some quite good um data models being built um by fintechs working with individual individual firms uh, which have allowed them to pretty much generate small what, 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 what my small focused common data input layers um so where you can effectively say okay we could turn this legislation that you're that you're trying to comply with into a fairly standardized set of asks and we can provide uh, a clear ontology um, of your own internal data of your own internal data sets that will feed those specific asks um and that has that has worked to an extent the third bit and the bit that i'm probably most interested in um is is i think still not being done by anybody very effectively which is to then say okay that's great but i don't really want to have to produce individual data models for every piece of legislation and also then a, 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 you know, a, a similar uh, input layer for um each uh, set, set of my systems when seen through that particular lens uh, what I really want is to have one common data input layer for all the legislation and one common layer for my legacy systems to, in to interface uh, with, with that. Um, so far, the only way we've seen that done is by, is, and this has actually been done by uh, a number of firms, has been actually to basically take a copy of not their granular data, but their aggregate data, uh, and then um, having taken that copy uh, to organise it uh, under um, agreed headings that they're, they're comfortable with internally and then to match that uh, with, um, with external le legislation. However, whenever that's been done, um, we tend to see it work in certain use cases and then fail quite dramatically in others. Um, and we've yet to see anyone put it all together across the piece. There are a couple of reg techs now who are particularly targeting this area. And who are looking at um, can they build, uh, if you like, a sort of dictionary of dictionaries? Um, so far, we've not seen anybody do that uh, with the relevant level of expertise across a wide enough field to make it work. But it's certainly an area that, that, that people are working in. Okay, great. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here on data ownership. I'm going to group them together. Um, yes. The short question is, what are your top tips for persuading business people to agree to being data owners? And the longer question <laughs> yep. is, um, you talked about current immaturity of data ownership. Um, to yep. what extent are you sure that data ownership is actually the right phrase? And what benefits are you expecting from this ownership? Is it yep. not responsibilities and accountabilities towards data that are easier to identify and control? including for example ownership of requirements for data yeah cool no, no really really good questions um so i think i think the second question sort of answers the first question 
Um, so the way to persuade people to own data is to teach them that the phrase data ownership is not as scary as it sounds. Um, so people sometimes think that if I'm being asked to take ownership of data, I am solely responsible for everything that comes in, is done and goes out. And that isn't that isn't the framework that we use when we talk to people uh, about it. Um, what, what we say is you, ha you own the decisions that you make using that data and you have to be comfortable with challenge of those decisions. And certainly in a regulator, that conversation can be had because regulators have this conversation all the time with their firms. So that we try and frame this uh, in a very, very similar way to how we regulate firms. So when we go to a firm on a firm visit, we expect them to understand themselves. Uh, and we expect them to understand the information they collect and what they do with it. We don't expect them uh, to uh, be fully accountable for every decision that every person makes when interacting with them. Uh, that's not that's not how it works. And similarly, we do this. We do the same with data. So we do talk about ownership. But we talk about ownership of decisions uh, rather than ownership of of information. And I think by ownership by having ownership of decisions, you can then get to that idea around, own, around owning requirements. Uh, and and put it and and, and um, requests and asks of the of the technology going forward, but I do think you have to get people to accept that they own their own uh, their own decisions with data, and that is a that's a big shift. Um, my top tip for doing this is is is, is genuinely um, to get senior people to take to, to take ownership of their own decisions, and that's been really really tough sometimes. Um, because people, you know, think of themselves as a part of a chain um, and as, as someone who takes a decision in a chain, not somebody who is who is responsible for what happens at that point in the chain. And that, that's a, the, 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 the dynamic that we're trying to shift. We have had some really good uh, work from from seniors who have kind of helped us push that message out. But it's, it's certainly it's certainly a hard job. That, that, that reminds me of something that I've seen um, on occasion with, uh, especially in, in data science projects, where um, each each time you come up with an answer or you come up with some insight, um, it, it, there's a habit of it generating new questions. And if you're not careful, you can end up in this spiral of procrastination. Um, yes. Have you seen Have you seen that? And, and how do you how do you how do you break out of it? Yeah. No. So so definitely definitely seen that. Um, and I think the the easiest way to, to break out of it is to find a use case. So the, the, the really simplest way is to find a use case that needs a really quick answer, because it's, be, it, it's amazing how quickly people will break out of that if something needs to be done. Um, and COVID has actually been a really, in many, well, in many ways for my particular team, it's been um, of some very sort of weird and rather twisted assistance in that, in, in that sense, um, because it's basically forced us to take a lot of decisions very, very quickly. And central banks are actually very good uh, at operating in a in crisis mode um, and we've really tried to leverage that and say okay if you can work this quickly when it's a crisis why does it then take you three or four months in sort of BAU to make the same decision um, and that certainly uh, has got quite a lot of traction um, but I think you do need that pressure that pressure of time and actually if um, if the uh, if the decision isn't isn't under pressure and doesn't doesn't need to be taken I would sort of move on from it and go on to the next one. I wouldn't try and solve that particular, that particular problem. Wait until it almost you need to wait until it's critical. People talk about waiting for a burning platform. I'm, I'm not sure about a burning platform. You just need you just need somebody somewhere to need to make that decision. And you'll be surprised how quickly you can then get them to accept that they also own that decision as well. Yeah, never let a good crisis go to waste, as they say. Something. Um, so another good question here. Um, what is the biggest blocker in your data innovation journey and how have you managed data hoarding and disposal versus having a single version of the truth? OK, um, so. Interestingly, I would say that the biggest blocker isn't data hoarding or people trying to get to a single version of the truth. I think probably in the first year to two years of our operation, there was a lot of a lot of challenge from specialists who thought, hang about, this is my data uh, and I am the single version of the truth um, and I will control my bit. And, you know, this has all worked before. This has all worked fine before. I think, to be honest with you, the volume of information that we're now processing just means that that just isn't tenable. It just doesn't work. Um, and so 
we've got beyond that where i think we've got to um is a real challenge around investment decisions and around what data we want to prioritize um and what um what um kind of applications make the best sense and how to do effective cost benefit analysis um in an area which has been traditionally pretty um analog uh, and not digital and that's probably been that, that's our current biggest challenge um people are fairly on board with sharing data um they're also um fairly on board with the idea that you can't have a single version of the truth you have to own your own interpretation of the data um but what they really struggle with is okay well what do i therefore then prioritize uh, and where do we put some fairly limited resources to it the other thing i would say and i think this is this is this is probably a a problem that a central bank has i would hope other sectors of the public sector have less of this challenge i hope certainly in the private sector have less of this challenge but we have that risk averse culture as well which we're still moving through um and i i think you know doing innovation in a central bank is not easy it is not something that uh comes naturally to central bankers they are they are by the nature of risk averse as well yeah that makes sense um so what role does data management play in your entire roadmap and what challenges have you experienced with respect to machine learning and analytics being carried out on bad data ah, okay um so i would say at the moment we've still got within the bank of england probably two broad camps um of people who want to treat um ai machine learning and new, new, new techniques as research activity and as research that can therefore be done uh and should be done uh in a fairly uncontrolled um ad hoc manner um with um some reference to standards but not with not with the data management standards at the at the absolute forefront and another camp um who work much more in the kind of operational space uh and on the, on the stuff that actually leads to decisions who have a very, very rigid view of data management and how data management is done. Um, and I think the work that my team has been doing and the stuff on find and fix and the machine learning, uh, what's what, what now a project was a POC, uh, work, work, work we're doing on the dark web, work we're doing uh, with public market monitoring data is starting to basically make both of those two camps realize that neither of them is right. Um, that if you have total uh, sort of control central control of your of your data you will not be able to innovate um but if you uh, have a purely innovation innovation based mindset you'll just create multiple versions um of the answer um and, and and never actually take a decision and we're starting to blend those together and the, the way we're doing the way we're doing that is basically by trying to make it as transparent as possible so i'm a great believer in the fact that there is no such thing as clean data i've never seen a clean data set um i don't think one exists i think you can always pick holes in data uh, however i do believe that you can have a data set which is in a good order and can be understood and you can see where both the, the good bits and the bad bits of that of, the, of that data set are uh, and that's where we try to get to to get people to actually communicate better about their data um and i think that certainly um we've had some success uh with people um you know actually being able to explain the information that they are presenting and to explain both its strengths and its weaknesses. Um, and if they can do that, they can then allow people to make more transparent decisions. Mm, the age old debate mm. about fit for purpose. Yeah, I think yeah. Can I, I chip in with one there. Cause, so one of the terms I'm sort of increasing or concepts that I'm increasingly seeing is people familiar with the old garbage in, garbage out view of the world. Yep actually moving towards a garbage in gospel out view. So if it's presented in a clever tool, it's sometimes believed as being correct more than it might be otherwise be the case. Yep. So that's part of my yep. question. Also Sally Barrow has put a question in which is very related to that is about the risks of shifting the balance towards automation and where would human intervention still be required? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so the garbage in gospel out, definitely. Um, see, we see that a lot. Um, <clears throat> I think I would go back to it, it. It does go back to transparency, and it goes back to people owning the, uh, owning those decisions. Um, it needs to be clear, and the you know you can build the shiniest graph uh, and the cleverest app, um, but if I can't if I can't understand where the data is coming from and what it's, what's being done with it, 
it's it's not going to help me make a decision. It's certainly not going to help me make a decision uh, that I can own uh, as as a decision maker. And that's you know a lot of the work that we do is around actually upskilling seniors to get them to be able to ask questions of data, uh, so, so so that they are not just um, impressed by the latest uh, the latest WYSI graph. On the automation point, um, I would the thing that I think um, that we we spend a lot of time doing when we talk to frontline staff is asking them what what they think where they add value what what's their value add and it's still I still it still worries me the amount of time that people tell me that their value add is maybe five or ten percent of their overall role um, and that that to me is not it's not a job that people should be doing when technology can can can, can, can actually help you spend more time doing value add uh, and that's that, that's really the message that we try to get across is what do you you know we're not we're not the experts when it comes to automation I, I have absolutely no idea how to automate any process that someone's doing already they will know better than i will uh, what i what i might be able to do is is help them work out how can i speed up the bits that frankly i don't i don't really want to do uh and uh, spend more time doing the stuff where I, where I add value. Uh, and I can hopefully link them up with some people that can help them do that. Uh, and that's sort of the, the approach that we've take, taken to those conversations. I think that's still difficult. I think that's difficult, really difficult in a, in a public sector institution, which um, will always have a limited budget, will always be trying to do more with less, uh, and will always see automation first and foremost as a way to uh, reduce spending. Um, and reduce infrastructure costs. I, I think that that's a challenge that, that we that, that we all live with. Um, and I suppose really what we try to do all the time is to say, actually, if you if, if that's your objective, then that's great. But your first objective should be how do we do the business that we're here to do better? Um, and if you do, if you have that conversation with frontline staff, ninety five percent of them will bite your hand off and say, please come and help me deal with this thing that I am really fed up doing. <laughs> Um, because I could actually be adding a lot more value over there. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so a question, sort of kind of related one. So Tim King's put a question in uh, based on the fact that when Network Rail and the regulator of the ORR identified systemic issues with data quality, uh, the two organisations recognised the value of ISO 8000 to provide a neutral benchmark for agreeing whether Network Rail is making progress in addressing the issues. So what role does the Bank of England see for external standards and particularly for machine interpretable approaches to data standards such as those uh, detailed in ISO 8000? Yeah, so that's so an excellent question. Uh, I, I, I profess no knowledge at all of the uh, of example cited, so I'm not going uh, to try, try and talk about the application in, in, in the network rail space. Um, in, the, in the banking space, uh, we see a huge potential uh, for, 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 data, for data standards and for data standards that can potentially also be automated. Um, we have seen a frustrating lack of take up, if we're honest, um, of, uh, of, of an, on, on a number of those standards. Um, and we have found it um, quite hard to get industry to work on those standards themselves. Quite often, uh, what is put to us as a Bank of England is, well, we, we, the Bank of England, should lead and we should we should set these standards. We're, we're quite cautious in this space. We are not a standard setting body. Uh, we are not um, a, uh, you know, we're, we're not staff with lots of data management specialists, lots of data, with, 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 with lots of um, people who understand the financial sector at that level of granularity. Um, we have some experience in payment systems. We have some experience in certain bits of the system, but we actually try and take a macro view. Uh, so we want to work. We really work in the aggregates, and that's where we're. Uh, that, 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 that's where we have our, our expertise. We are increasingly uh, trying to drive um, industry groups, consumer groups, uh, think tanks, public bodies, other areas of the public sector to work with us on data standards that can be used. And we have had some limited success uh, in that space. Again, uh, probably actually in the, pay in the payment space uh, rather than the regulatory space. I think we will see more of this. Um, I know when I talk to international counterparts, other regulators, um, there is an increasing appetite for standardization. Um, 
what I always say to industry is if you want a data standard, you should go and create it because getting global regulators to do it is definitely going to be slower <laughs> than, than, than you ever will because we will move we will move very 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 cautiously in this space because it's not our area of expertise and also because we will be having to balance you know the needs of large populations uh, uh, and, and, and disparate economies. Yeah, I think John Beard has put a comment there, which I think works fits very neatly in this space of federation of the willing can work. So yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good. I think we've um, we've come to the end of, the, of of our time slot. So thank you very much, Peter, for um, a very interesting talk. Uh, I think you know we can we generally gauge the, uh, the the level of interest that's been raised by the quality of the questions, and I think we've had some fantastic questions there.